In this video, I'm going to be drawing another page from my upcoming Toad Theme coloring book. And in this particular doodle, it puts the little guys in the coral reef environments. I'll also be discussing imposter syndrome as it pertains to artists. I'll discuss what it is, why we get it, and how to get over it. So if you're an artist who struggles with imposter syndrome, then stick around because this video is for you. Hey guys, Craig here. Hope everybody's doing well. Okay, so the topic of this speed drawing vlog is going to be imposter syndrome. And while even the most talented and accomplished artists often suffer from this mental affliction, I think it tends to impede the progress of newer artists more than it does seasoned artists. And I'll delve further into why I think that is in just a minute. But for now, just know that in this video, I'll be defining what imposter syndrome is, why we as artists often tend to get it, and how to get over it. So if you're ready, Let's start drawing. Okay, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, I just want to start off by defining exactly what imposter syndrome is. In a nutshell, it's when an individual doesn't believe that they deserve the success that they've achieved, or when they don't feel that their success was achieved legitimately, because they don't think that their skills or efforts merit their current level of success. And just know that imposter syndrome is not a condition that only artists struggle with. It's a mental struggle that you can encounter regardless of which career path you're on. Now, a lot of the reasons why people develop imposter syndrome are pretty much the same throughout all careers. But there are a couple of reasons why people get it that are somewhat specific to artists. And those are the reasons that I want to start out with here today. Now, before I get into them, I just want to preface this discussion by saying that the reasons I'm about to give are reasons that I believe people struggle with imposter syndrome, in my opinion. And some of you may not agree with me, and that's okay. In fact, if you don't agree with me, or you have your own opinions on why you think artists struggle with imposter syndrome, I'd love to hear what they are in the comments section below. I believe that this topic needs to be discussed openly, so don't hesitate to lend your two cents in the comments section of this video. Again, the reasons that I'm about to give are purely from my own experiences, so do with them what you will. That being said, let's get into it. Okay, so in my opinion, there are a few reasons why people tend to get imposter syndrome, but two of those reasons are somewhat specific to artists. And the first one is something that's kind of unique to artists in general, and that's the inverse relationship that occurs between the struggle of creating art and the level of acknowledgement or praise that we get from the world around us. Let me explain what I mean by that. So when you're first starting out as an artist, everything about the process of creating art seems difficult. Just simple things like getting your straight lines to look straight or your circles to look like circles is a lot harder when you're first getting started. Stuff like blending colors, understanding perspective, choosing color palettes that work well together, or even just being able to grasp the concepts of shadows and highlights are all things that are extremely difficult for new artists. And you usually have to struggle for hundreds or even thousands of hours to develop these skills to the point where they become second nature to you. So as you put in all of those hours, all of these tasks eventually become somewhat easier for you. Now that's not to say that seasoned artists don't struggle with their artwork. They most certainly do. And they struggle because they're always challenging themselves by attempting to create more complex artwork. But in this case, unless you're one of those artists who are always jumping outside of your comfort zone by creating artwork in new mediums that you're unfamiliar with, then the process of creating art, for those who stay strictly in their own medium, tends to get easier over time. In a nutshell, the more time you put in, the more your skill level increases, which in turn makes the process of creating art easier. And this is where the mind trip comes in. There's actually an inverse relationship between struggle and praise that's kind of unique to the art community. When you're first starting out, the process of creating art is very difficult and requires a lot of struggle on your part. But at the same time, the level of praise you get for your artwork is very low because it's usually not very good. So even though you're struggling to create artwork to the best of your ability, because your work may not be very good at this early stage of your artistic journey, the acknowledgement that you receive will probably not be proportionate to the level of effort that you're putting in to create the art. But then as you put in more and more hours, your skill level improves and the quality of your artwork improves as well. 
And what's more, the amount of praise you get for your artwork also increases immensely. And where the imposter syndrome kicks in is when you start to realize that you're getting way more praise and acknowledgement for doing something that is much easier for you to do now than it was when you were just getting started and receiving no praise at all. It's that inverse correlation that starts to mess with your mind. Because that inverse relationship really doesn't exist in too many other fields. Take athletes for instance. When you're first starting out, you're not very good and therefore you don't receive very much praise for your accomplishments. But as you work harder, you get stronger and faster, and as a result, you get more praise for everything you achieve. But once you reach a certain level of skill as an athlete, if you want to increase the level of praise you're getting even more, then your only option will be to struggle even more to improve your output. So if you're a runner and you want more praise, you're gonna to have to cut five seconds off your time. If you're a weightlifter and you want more praise, you're gonna to have to add another 100 pounds to your lift. You have no other option but to struggle harder to achieve superior results and therefore receive greater acknowledgement. So the relationship between struggle and praise advances in the same direction equally. But as an artist, you can create a piece of artwork in a particular theme and receive a thousand likes for it on social media. Then the very next day, you can create a second piece of artwork in a totally different theme and receive one million likes on it simply because your audience preferred the new theme to the first one. So even though the drawing process required nothing further of you as far as difficulty to create the second piece, it garnered a thousand times the praise of the first piece. And that can start to make you question your worth as an artist. Do you really deserve that much additional praise for almost no additional effort on your part? And it doesn't help matters that regardless of what your skill level is, you can always look around and find artists who are far more talented than you are, but aren't getting anywhere near the recognition that you are. And some of those artists, or at least the fans of those artists, may call you on that, which ends up messing with your mind even more. Because initially it was just you questioning whether or not you deserve the praise you were getting. But to hear someone else question it just basically confirms all of your self-doubts. And this is where the imposter syndrome really starts to ramp up. So I guess the next question is, well, then how do we overcome that feeling? And the simple answer is, you need to constantly remind yourself about just how many hours you've put in to get to where you are today. The length of time that it takes you to finish any particular piece of artwork is irrelevant. And that's because the only reason you're able to complete a piece of artwork that quickly at such a high level of quality is because of all of the long hard hours you struggled trying to master your craft over the previous years. So take pride in the fact that you can deliver high quality artwork in a short period of time, even if it's with very little effort on your part, because you busted your ass to get your skill level to the place where you can do that. So never apologize or feel guilty for being good at what you do. Own it and be proud of it. And as for other more talented artists not getting the recognition that they deserve, well that's not your fault. That's just a case of them doing a piss poor job of managing their art career. If you're a really great artist and your work isn't getting acknowledged, then you need to put down the pencil or the paintbrush and take a few courses on self-promotion and marketing. I'm probably going to piss off a few artists in this video, but oh well. Okay, so the second reason many artists suffer from imposter syndrome has to do with the misuse of a word, and that word is original. Now this is one that newer artists tend to suffer from more than seasoned or professional artists do. In fact, when I was teaching 3D animation in college, many of my students were taking my course as an elective in a four-year art program. So I was fortunate to be able to work with many very talented young artists over the years. And it always amazed me at just how brutally they would critique their own portfolios. In fact, one of the main reasons many of those students cited for not feeling ready to go out into the real world as professional artists was that they didn't feel that their work was original enough. And this brings me to why I feel that the art community is actually misusing the word original and why I think it's contributing to quite a few cases of imposter syndrome among newer artists. But before we discuss the misuse of the word original, let's talk about how it's currently being used properly in the art community. So one of the ways that the word original is being used correctly is when it's used to distinguish the difference between an actual painting or drawing and a print of that piece of artwork. 
So if you paint something on canvas and then later scan that painting so that you can print a thousand copies of it to sell in your online store, in this situation, the prints are copies and the canvas painting is the original. That's a proper use of the word original as it pertains to art. A second way that the word is being used properly is when you're trying to distinguish the difference between fan art and artwork that you conceptualized yourself. The fan art was influenced by other artists' ideas, whereas your own work was conceptualized entirely by you. This makes it your original art. So if you had a table at Comic-Con, you might have one side of your table dedicated to Marvel and DC characters that you've drawn, which are not your intellectual property. And the other side of your table would be dedicated to your own original artwork, which is your intellectual property. Again, this would be a proper use of the word original in artistic terms based on its actual definition. Now as for how the word original is being misused by the art community, it's when we rate somebody's artwork by either very original or not very original. And the problem with both of those statements is the use of the word very before the word original. Because saying very original insinuates that there are degrees of originality, and there aren't. The word original is binary. Either something is original or it's not. The word original means of origin, the very first, the one and only. To quote Highlander, There can be only one. Anything created after the first one is not original. And saying that something is sort of original is like saying that someone is sort of pregnant. Either you are or you aren't. So then why is the misuse of this word such a problem for newer artists? It's because everything we draw is influenced by something else. As humans, we are incapable of drawing something that we've never seen before. If I was to ask you right now to draw a dubaba, the first thing you would ask me is, what the hell is a dubaba? And when I said that I'm not going to tell you what it is, you'd probably then jump onto Google and try to find a picture of one. Now you wouldn't find a picture of one because they don't exist. So then you'd come back to me and say something like, well, what do they look like? You're asking me this because you need a frame of reference to be able to draw it. So if I told you that they look like jellyfish, then you'd probably start drawing something that looks like a jellyfish. We can only draw what we've already seen. Therefore, everything we draw is either in some way referenced or a copy of something else, meaning not original. Jake Parker has a great video on his channel that talks about an artist's creative bank account, which is basically just an accumulation of everything that you've ever drawn in your life stored nice and neatly in your memory. Now, when you're first starting out, you really don't have anything in your creative bank account. So when you're trying to create new art, you don't really have anything to withdraw. As a result, you tend to just reference artwork from other artists around you. But as the years go by and you get quite a few more drawings under your belt, your creative bank account starts to fill up, giving you plenty of techniques to draw from when you're creating your own original art. But here's the spin. Most people begin their artistic journey by copying or mimicking other artists. So every deposit that you make into your creative bank account in the beginning is based on copied artwork. So even when you get three, four, or five years down the road and you start creating art purely from memory, your original art is still gonna reflect bits and pieces of other artists' work. Even artwork from the greatest artists in the world show traces of artistic style from the people that they were influenced by when they were getting started. So if you're trying to achieve 100% originality in your artwork, and keep in mind that 100% originality is the only true definition of the word original, then you're gonna fail every time. There are always going to be traces of other artists' work entwined with your own. It's unavoidable. And if you were to go one step further and break down your artwork to its simplest form, then you won't stand a chance in hell of achieving complete originality. I mean, take this piece that I'm drawing right now, for instance. In its simplest form, it's nothing more than a bunch of straight lines and curve lines drawn together in a distinct way. Has any other artist ever used straight lines and curved lines to create a piece of artwork? Of course, billions of them. So that element of this drawing is not original. Has anyone ever drawn an illustration depicting toads before? I guarantee it. What about a coral reef themed drawing? Absolutely. How about a drawing that's created in a doodle art style such as this? There are probably millions of them on the internet right now. So then what's original about this piece? Well, I guarantee that I'm the first artist to ever draw this illustration line for line exactly this way. But does that make this piece original? Using the definition of the word original? No. But it does make it distinct from every other drawing of its kind. 
Now, some of you may be thinking to yourself, isn't this kind of nitpicking? And the answer is, yes, it is. Pretty much every seasoned or professional artist fully understands and accepts the fact that there is always going to be some element of influence or copying that finds its way into their original artwork, and most of them are okay with that. In fact, if you've never read the book Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon, I strongly recommend that you check it out. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. That being said, the problem arises when a newer artist starts to lose sleep over the fact that they referenced, or God forbid, copied a fence post from another artist's drawing that they then included in their own massive barnyard mural that they painted on the side of a building. And they feel so guilty about the fact that the bottom 2% of their painting has some reference to another artist working in it that they contemplate giving up on art altogether because they think that any artist who can't create 100% original artwork doesn't deserve to be called an artist, which is total bullshit. And this is why I think using the word original in this manner may be causing imposter syndrome in many new artists. So then how do new artists avoid falling into this trap? Well, the first thing that you need to do is accept the fact that there is always going to be some aspect of influence or similarity to other artists' work in your own original art. It's almost unavoidable. Secondly, if you are suffering from imposter syndrome, then stop using the word original to grade your artwork, because you're never going to achieve 100% originality, so try using the word distinct instead. Because the word distinct implies a comparison to something else, Therefore, a piece of artwork can vary in its level of distinction. So your goal as a new artist will be to try and make your artwork as distinct as possible compared to other styles similar to your own. You can still use the word original to distinguish your first renders or your own conceptual art from all of your other artwork. Just don't grade your artwork using a binary system. If every piece of artwork you create falls into the category of either original or a complete ripoff, with no gray area in between, then your artistic journey is going to be a long and miserable one, because you're going to be scrapping every single piece of art that you draw. As artists, our job is to take from everything that's around us, and that includes art, photos, and real life, and then just put it all together in a way that takes it to someplace new, by creating something that no one else has ever seen before. If you can learn to do that with conviction and allow yourself to realize that it's all part of the process of creating a better mousetrap, because that's really all we're doing as artists, is just trying to create a better mousetrap than the artists that we were influenced by, then your artistic career should go off without a hitch. Okay, so those are two reasons why people get imposter syndrome that are primarily exclusive to artists. But one of the main reasons why pretty much everyone who deals with imposter syndrome gets it is because of too much criticism, especially throughout childhood. I read a statistic that said 70% of people suffer from imposter syndrome, and that's not surprising. I mean, when you think about it, imposter syndrome is really nothing more than a bad case of self-doubt. And I can't think of anyone who doesn't suffer from that from time to time. So then I guess the next question is, why is criticism the main cause of why so many people struggle with this condition? And I think the answer to that question comes down to the type of criticism that we're talking about. I mean, constructive criticism is probably one of the best tools to help you grow as a person. It offers you an unbiased, honest opinion that you can use to help reevaluate the course you're taking to achieve whatever it is you're trying to achieve. In fact, without any real constructive criticism in our lives, especially in our early years, I think it would be damn near impossible to achieve anything at all in life. I mean, can you imagine how entitled we would all be if we were surrounded exclusively by people telling us how great we were, even when we sucked? And on a side note, this brings up my whole beef with the everyone gets a trophy policy that's been dominating grade school athletics for over the past few decades. Giving kids a trophy for pretty much doing absolutely nothing other than showing up has got to be one of the main contributors to why kids today are so out of shape and unmotivated. I mean, why struggle if you're still going to get a trophy, whether you put in the effort or not? What kind of message is that sending to kids today? And that's one of the things that I really love about CrossFit. I may not agree with the whole racing to lift weights while sacrificing proper form aspect of it, but what I do agree with is that the end goal of CrossFit is not necessarily to win, it's just to finish, because to finish you actually have to participate. You won't get any praise for just showing up to the gym in CrossFit. You've got to put in the work. Okay, I'm getting off topic here. Where was I? Oh yeah, 
So as useful as constructive criticism is, for both mental and physical development, criticism for the purpose of demoralization and belittlement is really nothing more than verbal abuse. And unfortunately, many men, women, and children suffer from this at the hands of abusive parents, loved ones, friends, or co-workers. Being told day after day by someone that you love, trust, or look up to that all of your accomplishments really don't amount to anything of any worth can be soul-crushing, especially to a child. And the worst thing about those kind of abusive people is that the more you achieve, the more malicious they get. And the reality of it is, there are a lot of abusive people in this world. So if you're someone who's spent their whole life being verbally beaten down by someone close to you, how are you supposed to climb out of that hole? I think the first thing to realize is that 100% of the criticism that they're bashing you with has absolutely nothing to do with you. It has to do with them, their insecurities, their lack of self-esteem, their lack of self-worth, and their overall inability to achieve anything good in their life. The easiest way to get over your failures and to feel better about yourself is to pull someone else down to your level of misery. They came up with the saying, misery loves company for a reason. So if you find yourself under assault from a barrage of unmerited criticism from someone you know, the best thing you can do for yourself is just to feel sorry for that person. Take a moment and put yourself in their shoes and try to imagine what a hell it must be going through life never having achieved any of your goals. If anything could make you bitter in life, that would be it. Now that being said, not all verbally abusive people are underachievers. Many of them are actually overachievers. They're actually perfectionists. And it's that extreme level of perfectionism that they hold themselves to that causes them to feel like a failure. And ironically, perfectionism is another cause of imposter syndrome. Everything that exists in nature is imperfect. And if whatever divine power that's running this universe is unable to achieve perfection, then who the hell are we as mere mortals to try and hold ourselves to that unattainable standard? Trying to achieve perfection in any field is hell on earth. So if there's someone in your life who's a perfectionist and who's also critical over you, again, the best thing that you can do for your own mental well-being is to let the criticism just roll off of you like water off a duck. And then put yourself in their shoes for a second and try to imagine what a horrible existence it must be trying to live up to that impossible standard of achievement. Words can hurt. But whenever somebody's comments make you feel like you're being attacked personally, you always have to step back and consider the source. Because if the source is someone who's suffering themselves, then the words they're throwing at you really don't carry much weight, because pain brings out the worst in all of us. So don't let yourself suffer at the hands of someone else's demons. Those inadequacy issues are theirs, not yours. Criticism is nothing more than free advice. If you find it helpful, take it. But if you don't, then leave it behind. It's challenging enough these days just living up to your own expectations, let alone someone else's. So if you ever find yourself doubting whether or not you actually deserve the level of success that you've been able to achieve, then ask yourself this question. If another artist had put in just as much effort as you had and achieved the exact same level of success that you did, would you think that they deserved it? Just based purely on their efforts. If you answer yes to that question, then there is absolutely no reason for you to feel like an imposter. But if you answer no, then you need to ask yourself what it is about their artistic journey that makes you feel like they don't deserve their success. And when doing this, be specific and be honest. Because whatever that reason is, it's probably the one thing that's holding you back from accepting your own success. And if that reason happens to be one of the reasons that I just previously mentioned, well then now you know how to overcome them. Imposter syndrome is a very real struggle for many artists, new and experienced alike. And although the reasons that I discussed in this video may seem trivial to some of you, you need to remember that there are many talented artists out there who will never realize their true artistic potential because they suffer from this disorder. So if this video was able to help even just one of you overcome your struggle with imposter syndrome, then the video was worth making. And if you're an artist who's dealt with imposter syndrome at some point throughout your own artistic career and have found a different way to get over it, let us know in the comments section below. Because I'm sure that there are many artists out there who would appreciate any help that they can get to overcome this. So that's pretty much everything I have to say on the topic of imposter syndrome. But that being said, 
I have a lot of drawing footage sitting on my computer doing absolutely nothing because I pretty much record myself every time I draw. So I would really like to make these speed drawing vlog videos a regular part of my YouTube channel. But I don't want these videos to be solely about subjects that I feel are important. I would love to have your input as well. So if there's a particular topic that you'd like to hear discussed and you want me to start off the discussion by giving you my perspective in one of my future videos, then let me know in the comments section below because I am wide open to all suggestions. I want to make this channel as useful to you guys as possible and the best way I can do that is if I know what you want and what you need. So don't be afraid to speak up. The feedback that you've all been giving me on my videos has been so instrumental for the growth of my channel so far, so thank you for that. The reason that I created this speed drawing playlist in the first place was because I myself find that watching other artists draw is something that really motivates me to draw. And I'm hoping that my videos will have the same effect on some of you. So if you do find these speed drawing videos motivational, then be sure to give the videos a like to let me know. Now I'm going to have some new drawing tutorial videos coming your way over the next few months, so be sure and watch out for them. My plan is to slowly start adding more artistic content to the channel in the coming year. But for now, I'm just going to stop babbling and finish off this drawing. So enjoy!
Okay, so hopefully this video in some small way will help you to overcome your struggle with imposter syndrome. Now, if you'd like to pick up a copy of that book that I mentioned earlier in the video, Steal Like an Artist, I'll have an affiliate link to it in the description of this video. And if you'd like to learn more about my process for drawing digitally, then be sure and check out my video, How to Draw and Paint in Adobe Illustrator. I'll put a link to that video at the end of this one. And if you'd like to check out more of my speed drawing vlog videos, I'll put a link to that playlist right here. Until next time, take care.